All right, it's five minutes past. I wonder whether we should um, kick off with some introductions. What do you think? Yeah. So, Kath, can you maybe move us on to introduction slides? That'll be really awesome. And welcome to the others as you are popping on. That's, that's amazing. I think we've got about 30 on the call at the moment. So I just wanted to introduce our um, very talented panelists that we are going to be hearing from today. So first of all, we have Matt Lambert from Summit. And uh, Summit has been a, a long-term training company in the um, hospitality and services industry. And their real focus is building that work readiness of people um, and accelerating the learning and sustaining the learning to make that work. And Matt is absolutely passionate about uh, development and education, but also fixing some of the systemic issues that prevent people from being able to uh, reach their potential and, and, and do their learning. He's got a business financial and learning background, which is very, very useful when we're looking at systemic issues. And um, he's been work, worked at various blue chip companies across just about all the continents, five continents and 19 countries, Matt, and uh, we, we love to have you here today and just get some of your practical experience and some of your innovative thoughts. That's the one thing I always love about Matt is the, the innovative conversations that we have and sometimes a bit of a sparring from different perspectives, which is really, really cool. And then we have Kathy Kraft from uh, Catalyst Consulting. She's currently holding a GM role at Catalyst to be um, developing delivery for clients as well as uh, keeping the team running. That's been going for over 20 years now. Thank goodness Kathy has joined my team so that she can allow me space to write books and innovate and, and run some fun webinars. Kathy's got a deep experience in talent management across one of the biggest banking sector industries right the way through Africa um, and a global role. And I love what I love about Kathy is always bringing creative, innovative solutions that are fast and, and friendly and fun into organizations. So I think we're going to have some fun today with Kathy and Matt keeping them um, in check. They both love talking and they both love joking <laughs> and going off topic. So it's my job to kind of keep them together. And for those of you that don't know me yet, I'm Debbie Craig, MD of Catalyst Consulting and, and founder, also been around for many years. And my passion is in developing people and organizations. So we spend a lot of time experimenting and co-creating with our clients to raise the bar on how we manage talent and how we get the most out of our people and particularly finding potential um, in areas, in unexpected areas and innovating to, to do that. So just a couple of things um, today. I see we are, um, we've got the webinar set up so we won't be um, doing all the cameras and stuff. And I think you, unfortunately, we, you have the muzzles on today, but I hope that you're gonna be using your chat function and the Q and A function today so that we can see who's arrived, what they're saying, where they're from. So for those who have just joined us, please put into the chat function where you're from um, and anything you have in terms of an expectation. And if you have a question, there's a Q&A button for you to ask the question. So we'll be helping to track that. Um, so maybe just to, to kick off with um, a couple of things about what we are noticing in the world. Kath, if you can uh, move us on. And uh, just thinking about my own experience pre-COVID, in COVID, post-COVID, and you know, a, a lot of the, the work that we've been doing is around building capability for the future. And pre-COVID, we were gearing up for digitization and disruption and exponential change and technologies coming in and um, dealing with leadership gaps and economic uncertainty. So we already were gearing for change, but a lot of those were, were happening fast, but not as fast as we are experiencing now. So during the COVID times, suddenly, <laughs> the things that we thought was going to take us a few months to get ready for a strategy change or a structure change or a system change. All of a sudden we had days, not months anymore. And we had to fundamentally get people from the offices into home, set up, equipped, be able to communicate with each other, learn new skills, redirect people's roles, redirect people's skills, upskill people rapidly on technologies to collaborate and communicate and connect with clients. And we had to make some immediate and urgent scenario planning decisions as to how we were going to respond to the, 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 the world and what was changing. Um, and in post COVID, we're facing, you know, some people call it a new normal, some people call it a new abnormal, we don't actually know. So we're moving into a situation of complete uncertainty. And we need to find a way of managing what we think might still be something similar or the same or some level of stability and predictability. But at the same time, moving into being absolutely ready for anything and to be agile 
um, and, and fast and speedy with change. Thanks, Kath. So I just thought I'd stick this up because I don't know about you, but some days life uh, feels like a never ending obstacle course with no map and no end in sight. And you just feel like you're chewing through the mud and figuring out your next move and taking your, your body and your well being and your energy with you to figure out how you're going to face the next day. And just for me personally, I'm, I'm a face-to-face I'm -face facilitator. I'm passionate about global traveling. I love wine. Um, I'm a hugger. So um, lockdown for me, it was a serious challenge. I had to overcome a lot of those preferences and find new ways of doing things. Um, but luckily it did give me some time to do some creative things with our clients and, and, and to write a book, which I hope you're all going to join us um, at the launch pretty soon. So I just wanted to check a little bit about what we are noticing. So Kath, if you can just move on. And in our own client spaces, uh, both locally and internationally, we're noticing a huge focus on re-strategizing and scenario planning and re-looking at what the market might look like in the next couple of weeks, months, and in the next couple of years. And a lot of restructuring, if we look at the structure piece of operating models changing and um, trying to slim down and find lean ways of, re of changing the structure and having more gig economy or contract work um, setups. And that requires an HR capability that is able to quickly and, and um, in, a, in a lean manner help organizations and leaders to relook at their business and their structures and their relationships with their staff. We're also finding a lot of um, almost a, a trade-off between sort of optimization, standardization, efficiency with processes on the one hand, and on the other hand, there's a need for innovation, which is more expensive and more, more higher change, and finding that balance between the two and doing change management is a critical issue in organizations. I mean, every organization we're in is doing massive technological upgrades, looking at the next generation architecture, figuring out how they can make technology the competitive advantage. And of course, the biggest change we've been seen or well, the impact of change is on the roles people are needing to do. Many people have actually had to shift roles in the short term to deal with extraordinary demand in, in some of our organizations. Product, certain products have increased through the roof and in different areas and other pro products have decreased and teams have had to move around. And we're starting to look for a much more global mobile pool of resources and those that are willing to contract um, and, and where do we source and develop and grow and retain these kind of people. So this talk and this time today, this hour is about how do we rapidly respond to these kind of massive changes that are facing us? Um, you know, how do we organize ourselves differently? How do we execute differently? How do we enable differently? And how do we empower and engage our people so that we can really achieve every single person operating at their full speed and full performance and full potential in organizations. So let me hand over to Kathy, who's going to share a little bit with us around, you know, how can we adjust and build capability in the HR space differently? Thanks, Kath. Thanks, Deb. Um, so we've heard from Deb around how we need to evolve the way we organize, the way we execute, how we enable, how we engage our people. Uh, it requires a fundamental paradigm shift in a number of ways. Now, last year already, pre-COVID, uh, Deloitte did a human capital survey where they surveyed 10,000 uh, business and human capital executives across the globe. And bottom line is that 80% of those CEOs that were interviewed believe that the biggest challenge their organization faces is in meeting their strategic objectives, is having a sufficiently agile workforce. Now, agile is one of those one of those words that we all think we know what it means, and it sounds really sexy, and it seems to be the buzzword of the day. But how we actually enhance business performance to build and sustain transformation means that employees are required to mobilize and master new skills in a fundamentally different way. Uh, people strategies have become so much more complex, uh, and that was starting to happen even before COVID. COVID has fundamentally shifted and accelerated the, the trends and factors that have been impacting our world for years already. And so, you know, the paradigm shift in the way that HR partners with the business, but also in how we build capabilities with leaders, um, is really what we're going to talk about today. So let's explore that shift a little. Uh, I'm sure you 
in most of your organizations will have some kind of people or talent calendar that looks a little like this, right? Um, you will do some kind of planning exercise in Jan or somewhere around your um, financial year end or beginning of your new financial year. You'll do some work around identifying your talent. You'll figure out what kind of talent you need and you'll do some attractions and strategic sourcing. You will look at how to develop your talent, um, how to accelerate development in this crazy time, how to enable self-driven learning. You'll have a look at how to retain that talent. You will engage that talent somewhere along the way. You'll have some strategic talent reviews, looking at critical positions and succession, making sure that we manage risk. But what is fundamental to this process is that it is managing the business of today, right? It is managing the risks that exist in our businesses today. And talent management is no longer a linear process. People strategies are no longer linear. They are no longer one step follows another, follows another, Jan through December, and then we rinse and repeat and we do it again next year. Talent management now is a dynamic, agile, integrated process that goodness knows where the beginning and end of it is. Because when you shift one lever, as we can see, another something else changes in the business. Um, and how we identify, retain, develop, review, performance manage, and engage our talent um, will shift depending on the shifting landscape in our business. And so what does that shift look like? Um, a couple of years ago, um, Catalyst worked on, on a talent 4.0 framework, which looked at, you know, how do we plan for talent, performance manage talent, identify talent, et cetera, central to, um, you know, an ongoing talent review process. The shift now is shifting away from having talent at the center to really having our business and our business's strategic context and our employee and customer experience enabled by digital platforms at the center of this model. Um, you'll see in the center, which is our strategic context, we look at the business's purpose and strategy. We look at the business operating model. We look at the value chain and ecosystem of that business. We look at the governance and decision making that's required. And a lot of um, how we shift businesses now is looking at those structures and those con constructs. We look at culture and change. What is the impact of that on employee experience and customer experience? To what degree are they aligned in our business? And how are we enabled, enabling that from a digital perspective? I'm gonna hand over in a minute to, to Matt to look at um, you know, the technology and, and knowledge management pieces that really can help us to drive our people practices and processes. But I'm gonna stand still on this model for a moment. So if we take the center, which is our strategic context, and we have a look at what does that then mean for our um, people practices, processes, systems, capability. We need to have a look at how we shape an agile workforce. And this is going to be one of our focus areas a little, late, a little later. That's really about agile OD. It's about agile roles and flexible structures, smart teams. It's about how do we plan for capabilities versus planning for roles. It's about a rapid realignment of capability. As Deb said, we no longer have months or weeks, weeks or months or years to plan for changes in our business. We have to be able to do this rapidly. Uh, matching is really about how do we differentiate and personalize our EVP? What are, or how are we showing up as organizations as the employer of choice for the employee of choice? And the real concept here is not full-time employees necessarily, but how do we engage different parts um, of, of our own businesses and, and external um, talent pools to deliver? How do we tap into the gig economy's knowledge and capability? How do we use trusted partners and, and how do we outsource? Um, it's about looking at internal and external talent pipelines, gamified assessment and talent profiling. How do we do that quickly? Mobilizing our employees is really about how do we manage performance and evolve, you know, in an evolving organization and how do we, and fluid structures, right? Uh, managing our employees and managing our people practices is about driving the organization of the future, not just the organization, customers, products, services that we sit with today, but how does that evolve over time? Mentoring is really about how we engage talent and strengthen our employee experience. 
And mastery, which, which Matt will take us through in a bit, is really about how do we accelerate and enable learning. Now, of course, we can't within an hour today stand still on each of these elements, but we are going to focus on the mapping piece, which is really, really around that sort of shaping and, and structuring an agile workforce uh, and the mastery piece. So how do we accelerate and enable learning uh, within a changing and shifting business landscape? Um, and so over to Matt, you know, we, my thoughts from a, from a tech and digital enablement perspective is really, you know, the technological advancements, which are not new, um, and we've been talking about them for a long time. All of us have had digitization strategies in our business forever. Um, and there's always that joke that's going around at the moment around, you know, who has been the greatest catalyst of your digitization strategy? Is it your CEO? Is it your CIO? Do you have a digital officer? Uh, or is it in fact COVID? And so, you know, the, the place that we are in is tech doesn't create value for an organization if we are not connecting people and processes uh, and systems uh, in a systemic and fundamentally new way. And so with that in mind, I will hand you over to Matt. Yeah, thanks so much, Kath, I appreciate it. So, you know, what I'm gonna do today is really, in respect to the strategic context, is really give you an understanding of digital enablement and how it really impacts on customer experience, employee experience, and really drives your company's goals, missions, purpose, values. So the, the inside of it and how that relates to, you know, knowledge management and more importantly, scalability of knowledge and um, and so that you can take this back and you can go back to COVID or your CIO or whoever it is and you can be within you know three minutes I can create and turn you into a fundi on, on digital enablement that's my uh, that's my goal for this particular uh, slide so I, I hope it works so you know looking at the core of the model and um, that uh, Kathy referred to you know that that strategic DNA of your business you know, the success of your business is really related to that knowledge, but more importantly, the scalability of that knowledge. And the only way in respect of organizations today and their structures and how they're dispersed to disseminate that information or that knowledge is ensuring that you've got digital enablement at hand, you know, platforms that allow rapid scalability. So, before I get to, you know, what is digital enablement, um, which is, sounds like quite a sexy word, and, and it is, is I want to sort of answer or ask at the same time sort of three questions, you know. One, so what are the fundamentals? What is the starting point of, of digital enablement? What is it actually? Uh, how does this affect customer and employee experience and how can it drive it? Um, as Kathy said, it's not the foundation for it, but it uh, definitely can help drive it. And importantly, how can digital enablement uh, help drive your company's goals, vision, mission, uh, and purpose, which is obviously related to um, what your employees and your customers experience and how you are able to transfer your knowledge to your employees in an effective ma matter uh, or measure um, to be able to achieve your company's goals. So, you know, the starting point for digital enablement is really something super sexy feedback. So, you know, feedback and importantly, the system, systematic collection of feedback. Now, a big buzzword, Kathy was speaking about buzzwords earlier, is big data. Big data would sound a lot less attractive if someone said it's just big feedback, you know, and that's really what data is, okay? And, and so, why that is important in respect of digital enablement is digital enablement is ensuring you have the correct systems, which is the methods of collection, evaluation, forecasting, and correction tools to leverage off that feedback. And I want to sort of bring it into a, a metaphor that I'm from Durban. I'm currently looking out of the ocean. There's lots of ships um, that really sort of makes sense. And what I'm trying to um, put forward to all of you is really is that if you think of feedback as almost a compass bearing. So, you know, a ship goes on course um, to ensure that it's on the right course. In the olden days, it used to stop um, or pause and, and take a compass bearing. And if you think about how that might relate to uh, employee experience or customer experience in an organization, that might be an ENPS or Net Promoter Score Survey. And then you understand, okay, we've taken the compass bearing, we know where we're at, we are the correct or we stay the course. And then, 
as we evolve as organizations and as technology evolved in respect of the metaphor, uh, you can overlay trend analysis or forecasting. And so you've got something very much akin to GPS. So now you've collected all this feedback, all this information, and now you can plot a way forward, provided that you're hitting the milestones along the way. And then, you know, looking at how this then ties into knowledge management in respect of the metaphor and how digital enablement is key at this particular point in time, referring to the scale of organizations and how they're dispersed, is imagine now you've got this ship, you know, this, whether it's an ocean liner um, or speedboat, I know Kathy referred to some of, the, some of these metaphors uh, just now, which we actually didn't plan. And if you think about that, you might have, you know, you might have, the best GPS, you might have taken all the compass bearings, um, but that ship's not going to go anywhere unless the people on board the ship know how to operate that ship. And not only operate it from a technical perspective, but operate it in respect of capabilities, how to communicate effectively to make sure the message gets down the line in the ship. So, you know, the reality of the situation is that if you think of it in that context, uh, digital enablement, it's really about how we are collecting our information, how we're using that information. And then when we have that information, how we're disseminating that information in respect of identifying gaps in knowledge and then being able to ensure people are able to really drive the ship. And today I'm going to be speaking about some um, interesting elements around accelerating um, and enabling learning in respect of this. So with that in mind, before I get to, you know, the foundation before that is really around the mapping and the development of an agile workforce. So I hand back to, to Cathy. Thanks so much. So let's explore this concept of, of an agile organization or an agile workforce. Um, this visual was taken from, from a really sort of pivotal article published by, by McKinsey um, two years ago called The Five Trademarks of Agile Organizations. And it really helped us um, to, to understand and take this concept of agile and apply it to organizations. Agile, I'm sure most of you will know, came from um, a, a shift in the way uh, software developers um, manage the software development cycle. So rather than spending two years developing something from beginning to end and making it perfect, they, they developed in increments. And so they developed in, in releases to, to deal with small pieces of functionality, get it working, add another one, make sure that both of them work together, add another one, make sure all three work together. And so you get to a minimum viable um, piece of software a lot faster than the two years. Now, the reason that that happened, of course, is that technology is shifting and accelerating um, at, at an exponential rate. And so software developers didn't have the time to take two years to develop something. And that's, a, that's very similar in our organizations today if we think about um, how our world of work is changing and shifting. But I do find the concept of agile a lot easier to explain with an analogy. And as Matt said, I promise this wasn't planned. Um, but imagine for a moment in your organization, you have two teams of 50, right? That are in a race to get from SA somewhere. Let's call it Durban because that's where Matt is. Um, to get from Durban to Portugal, okay? The only rule is that you have to go by water. So you're not allowed to fly, you're not allowed to take a car, um, you have to go by water. So one team decides that they're gonna go on a big ocean liner, right? Uh, and that you can, you can imagine is like your traditional hierarchy that we see on the left of the screen. So we have a big ocean liner, it's sturdy, uh, it's pretty solid, um, everybody has pretty well-defined roles. You have a top-down hierarchy, what the captain says goes. Everybody knows the bits and pieces that they need to do. They've been well-trained and well-instructed on everybody's jobs, right? The second team, which we can compare to, to an agile structure on the right-hand side, decides that they're not going to go on the big fat ocean liner, which is big enough to take all 50 people at the same pace, right? They've decided that they are going to split up into 10 teams of five on smaller speedboats. OK, 
Okay, so let's for a moment think about what the, the benefits and drawbacks of each might be. Your ocean liner on the left, well established, uh, well known, easy to identify, um, you know, roles are clear. Um, your speedboats on the right are smaller, um, more autonomous, easier to, to navigate. Um, you have, yes, perhaps a little bit of role uh, ambiguity because um, you have much smaller teams. Um, and you have to sit and think about, are both teams going to reach their destination? Probably. Uh, who's going to get there first? Probably the speedboats. Maybe not. Depends on what happens along the way. Which team can respond better to changes in the weather? Um, if you think about, you know, an ocean liner like the Titanic, uh, imagine for a moment that on your trip along the way, you hit an iceberg. Well, let's try not to hit the iceberg. But imagine there's an iceberg along the way. Which teams are going to better be able to navigate around that iceberg? And if we think back to, to you know, the story that Matt has just told us around, you know, trend, uh, data and trend analysis being our GPS, the better we are able to do that, the better both the agile teams, i.e. the 10 speedboats, and the ocean liner are able to navigate around the, um, the iceberg. So when we think of Agile OD and when we think about shaping an Agile workforce uh, and shaping uh, and structuring an organization, we've got to think about a couple of things. We have to think about departmentalization. Is it silos? Is it smaller teams? We have to think about a chain of command. Do we have um, one person playing a leadership role, but actually everybody's equally accountable? We have to talk about a span of control. We have to think about, do we centralize or do we decentralize? So our ocean liner is deeply centralized. Um, our speedboats are decentralized. We have to think about work specialization. Uh, we have to think about the degree of formalization. Um, and in agile organizations, this means flat metric structures. It means distributed authority. So if we think about the ocean liner versus the 10 speedboats, okay, the 10 speedboats have a, a guiding star or a north star which says we need to get to Portugal. Um, but they can get there in whatever way makes sense to them based on the weather that they face along the way and the people they have on the boat with them. Uh, the ocean liner has the North Star and everybody's on their journey, come hell or high water, if you'll excuse the phrase, right? Uh, in agile organizations, it means broad access to information. Um, it means multi-directional career paths. So if the dude driving the speedboat has a headache, somebody else has got to step in because the boat's not going to drive itself, right? Um, it's similarly on the ocean liner. It has high workforce mobility. Um, we look at loyalty based on continued opportunities. Um, work is about what you do in an organization, not just where you go on a daily basis in agile organizations. It is driven by team contributions, not by individual contributions. It is about an integration of career and life. It is about competencies that define jobs and a focus on capabilities not just on technical competence and role. And people fundamentally in an agile structure have different jobs and different skills. Whereas in a more traditional hierarchy or a traditional structure, um, people have very well-defined roles and don't color outside of the lines because somebody else has got the job to do that other thing, right? And so the, the ability to be creative um, and to think outside of the box in a traditional hierarchy is somewhat snarful. But I would like to stand still for a moment on uh, debunking some myths around agile org design. So this concept of agile came up and very quickly we started looking at agile as a way for organizations to better be able to respond to disruption. Okay. And as with all new concepts, the tendency for organizations to go, well, we need to throw away our hierarchy, we need to throw away our ocean liner, and everybody needs to get on a speedboat uh, is something that creates a lot of stress and tension, because that's a very difficult thing to do. 
And so what I want to tell you is that agile org design is about looking at what parts of your organization can you agilify, if you like, uh, or can you structure in an agile way versus what parts of your organization actually require us to stick to relatively um, traditional hierarchies and mandates and structures and spans of control. So on your top left, um, you have an executive leadership team, right? So that is your, your EXCO or your STRATCO or whatever you call your central leadership team, which is ultimately responsible for strategic direction, alignment and culture, amongst other things, but broad sweeping brushstrokes, right? They are the guys that are deciding that Portugal is where we're going, okay? Now, from both a governance perspective, um, you know, those guys still hold that ultimate accountability and responsibility for the organization. And there are, if you think about, you know, in South Africa, we have the Companies Act, we have, and they have fiduciary accountability. And so they are mandated to operate in a particular way. They are still a relatively traditional hierarchy. Okay, you can't have 10 CEOs in an organization, you need to have one person that still takes ultimate accountability. They have a permanent and long term ongoing strategic role. Okay, if you look bottom left, you have your execution focus teams, which are fundamentally responsible for delivering value to the business or the customer. You also can't have those teams shifting and changing consistently. Right, your finance department, your IT, your HR, your supply chain department, they are there to do a particular job in a particular way. And they also have a permanent, if less strategic, more operational role. There again, um, traditional hierarchies are more appropriate. But when you start looking at temporary roles and temporary um, needs, you look at project leadership teams. Those people and those teams are ultimately responsible for organizational capability and transformation. So if you think about an R&D team or you think about an innovation team or you think about um, you know, a digitization team even, and the two are, are linked, of course, you have a leadership team and an execution team from a project perspective. This is about looking forward into the future or looking at what is changing now that we need to fix or transform or fundamentally shift and quickly, right? Are, they, are we gonna need those people forever? No, we're not. And so there you have a real opportunity when there are needs in your organization that are not permanent, that you have a look at agile structures. Where can we bring people into the organization that can take a, a basket of skills and experience and apply it broadly in the organization for short-term needs? At the center and the heart of it all, I couldn't help myself, of course, is our customer. So how do we, how do we set up uh, smart teams? Now, this uh, was adapted from, from a Deloitte article around um, Agile and smart teams. And so I'm going to take you through um, those Agile teams and how we set them up. So we need to be providing a stimulating environment, right? So the purpose and meaning of those teams needs to be very clear. So back to, you know, our McKinsey article on the... Um, trademarks of uh, agile organizations. They call it a guiding star or a north star. The purpose and meaning needs to be very clear. And the complexity match between the team and the people in the team also needs to be clear. We have to be able to master quickly. And this is about feedback. It's about rapid reskilling. And Matt's going to talk us through some of that in a minute. It's about multi-skilling. It's about mentoring. How can we very quickly build capacity and capability in our teams through feedback, coaching, and support on an ongoing basis? We have to create clarity around roles. We have to, back to our, our agile example around distributed authority, right? People need to have autonomy and access to information so that they can collaborate. But we need to set boundaries for collaboration um, in place. They need to be relational, right? So we need to be able to recognize and reward uh, our teams appropriately. We need to be able to provide the support to them and we need to be able to connect with customers. 
And the final thing is it needs to be tolerable. And I think this is probably the one that COVID messes with the most at the moment, um, is having a look at what is that work-life balance or work-life blend look like? How do we create flexibility for people? For years and years, we've always said that people can't work from home. Well, COVID has proven us dif proven it differently, right? Um, how do we look at manageable demands on people? <clears throat> now, one thing that um, we will provide to you as a gift coming out of this, uh, and I'm going to flash it up on the screen very quickly so that you can see the intent is not that you read it through now, but you'll receive it post the webinar. Um, a little bit of guidance around how we can shift some of those traditional roles, both within our hierarchies and within agile teams. And so in our traditional roles, we look at employees, we look at teams in, a, in, a, in, in quite a traditional way. We look at line managers that manage people. We look at um, specialists that have really deep key knowledge. We look at functional or business leaders that look after big teams of specialists and line managers and talent. And we look at an exco, which remains that sort of guiding star. How we shift that is by looking at what parts of agile roles and agile teams can we take. And so we shift the focus from employees to talent. Uh, traditionally, you have around 10 to 15% of your organization is talent. Uh, and in the new world, talent is a fundamentally different construct. Uh, teams are now sometimes traditional teams, sometimes agile teams. Uh, line managers own teams and processes, not people. Uh, SMEs are responsible for building capability across the organization. Um, leaders are responsible for, for leading and identifying and checking that GPS and that trend analysis constantly. And your exco remains accountable for... Um, so I'll flash it up for you very quickly. Um, and we'll send this through to you when we're done. So a quick note as I close out on how we need to be shifting our mindsets. From a unified, from static objectives to unified mission, uh, continuous talent acquisition, continuous learning, and this is really where Matt's gonna come in talking about how we do that and how we establish a learning culture. Employee experience, not records. Uh, people, not processes. Um, trust, not control teams, not individuals, and accountability, not bureaucracy. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand you straight over to Matt to talk you through the how we build and accelerate and enable learning in our organizations. Great. Thanks so much, Kat. I appreciate it. So I, I learned a lot of, more about uh, agile uh, uh, development from that perspective and uh, I'll, I'll just make sure that uh, I just push all my it's on, I can just push all my work onto my to my management team and uh, they'll uh, they then must do the work then I'll make the decision so uh, no, I'm joking but that's uh, no fantastic thank you very much so I'm gonna um, master I'm gonna not master but I'm gonna look at mastery in respect of accelerating enabling learning and uh, one of the things uh, that I am just wary of time today, so I might, one of the areas that I'll skip over a little bit more because perhaps uh, does not focus as much on accelerating and enabling learning to an extent, I might briefly touch on that, is on capabilities. So what you see here is, I'm gonna look at mastery through the lens of a really interesting uh, report uh, that was done quite recently which was the Deloitte 2020 Human Capital uh, Trends Report. Very interesting, obviously, because of its timing uh, as well. And you know, looking at mastery through the lens of organizational resilience, it's obviously a buzzword at the moment, but very pertinent to where we are. So what it really looks like is what are the five trends or shifts that need to happen to ensure organizational resilience going forward? And most of them are really focused on the mastery side of things. So accelerating and enabling uh, learning. And I'll focus on, on those key, which are sort of the first three, but just to sort of cap or sort of pause is that where we are and where we're moving to is, you know, from building skills to cultivating capabilities. So uh, from moving from developing specific work or skill sets for the short term to leveraging of the passion of the learner, the, the employee for self-exploration of learning. And then a shift from a focus on formal training and edu education to support learning in the flow of work. 
the other two sort of outside of the conversation today, but still interesting is rewarding, shifting from rewarding uh, based on work output to based on actually developing capabilities that really then future proof uh, your business. And then from preparing the workforce with more of an internal focus, more of really around the organization is how does the organization uh, now work within the aspect of society and contribute to society as a whole. So I'm going to focus on really the, the first three, maybe 10, just from a timing perspective, less on capabilities, because we have had some information there. So Kath, if you don't mind, just going to the next screen. So, you know, what I'll touch on is just on, on the building skill sets uh, side of things and to cultivating capabilities is, um, you know, as we know, I'm going to share a little bit of information that came out of that particular report and what some of the research is saying out of the report and after the, the, uh, the, the actual um, webinar, we can share the report with you. But very interesting at this particular point in time is 48% of organizations that were surveyed in this and CEOs, uh, talent uh, executives, HR executives, uh, responded in saying that, you know, like I said, 48% higher for technical skills and 52% of respondents said they hire for capability, but more and most importantly, learning capability. And that makes a lot of sense. And particularly to what obviously Kathy spoke to earlier about kind of all these rapid shifts, a lot of them coming from a technology perspective where a role uh, within an organization might evolve and change over time. And as such, it's important that employees have the ability to rapidly and consistently learn more skill sets to be able to ensure that they grow within the organization. So, you know, looking at support learning uh, in the flow of work, um, some interesting results out of that survey is that 54% you know, of respondents really said that the development of individual capabilities uh, needs to rest with the employee themselves. And the reason they say that is that, you know, by exploring um, new domains and learning from others, both within and outside the organization is that, you know, learners can really, you know, spot, um, sorry, this is really speaking towards, sorry, leveraging or self-exploration. Apologies, there's a slight mistake in the uh, slide deck there. But what it means is that by learning or self-exploring is that uh, employees um, from, you know, learn from within the organization and outside the organization, they can reinvent themselves and importantly, take control of their learning so that it's not so much of a top-down mandate in respect of that. And then supporting learning in the flow of work is, is really, um, why that's interesting um, is that 92% of respondents in the, the Human Capital Trend Report said that within the next three to five years, there's gonna be a critical focus on learning and development in the organization. Uh, because it's key for the organization's survival. However, 61% said that uh, they're unsure as how they're going to do it. And the reason is, is that, you know, the, the, many of the respondents are looking at how they currently operate in respect of how they currently educate and whether that be classroom based, whatever the case would be. And they're just going, how do we grow this model? How do we rapidly expand this model to get to everyone in respect of what they need to learn in this short period of time? And, and why, you know, why this is interesting is that what we know from, from data is that learning through experience has a better educational impact and retention of information than pure classroom. A combination of the, of the both is, is always best, um, but nonetheless, learning through experience has some great results. And, you know, what that really means in respect of learning and the flow of work is, you know, I, I related back to a very simple example. The other last weekend, I had to uh, reset my gate motor and not wanting to have to phone uh, an electrician or someone to come through and reset my gate motor. What did I do? I needed to learn in that moment in the flow of work and through experience. So I got on, hopped onto YouTube and Googled my mate or YouTube, my maker, my gate remote and or gate motor and uh, understood how do you reset it? And I did that. And now... I feel confident in being able to consistently do that 
you know, resetting of that gate um, because I had that experience. So maybe um, if you'd like to just uh, move on there. Yeah. I just want to kind of, before I, I tackle some of how can we, or some practical sort of things we've got to think of um, in respect of both capability skill sets and, um, you know, obviously the uh, aspects around uh, leveraging of um, employees, uh, self-learning capabilities, and then supporting learning the flow of workers. What really struck me coming out of this report, because uh, particularly for the audience um, on board, is that you know, 84% of those respondents agree that you know, reinvention of the workforce through lifelong learning is critically important to their development strategies. And interesting, this wasn't development strategies and people development strategies, development strategies and business development strategies. So what they're saying is that 84% of the respondents believe that for the business to grow, survive, learning is key, okay? Yet 16% said they expect their organization to make a significant investment increase in this area over the next three years. So you can start to see, you know, maybe where some gaps are starting to occur. And then importantly, 75% of those respondents expect to source new skills and capabilities primarily by reskilling their current workforce. So what this really means is that most of the organizations believe learning is key. And most of the organization believes that they'll be able to move towards a future state by reskilling people in the organization. But none of the organizations are making the investment that they need to. So the reality of the situation is it really seems unlikely that this is going to occur. And it's quite critical because the businesses that get it right um, will obviously be successful. So I wanted to share that with you because it's quite an interesting takeaway from that, that research and, and understanding, you know, to particularly where we are right now in this, you know, COVID situation, the what we need to think about in respect of going forward in terms of the business and its success. So if we, if we go to some little practical tips, I'm just wary of, of, of time um, is if I look at sort of, and I'm going to park capabilities for now because we've got not a whole lot of time and there's a lot in the deck that you can refer to. But practically, how do we um, create the passion of the explorer? How do we create supporting learning in the flow of work? And some key things that you need to do if you're going to go that route is when you are grouping or structuring learning programs, you know, group all of them together by function. So if what I mean by that is if you are looking at supply chain, okay, there might be a whole lot of different learnings in supply chain. Okay. Put it all together and say, here's the supply chain learning program. Okay. Give access to all of those learning programs or topics, information in that learning program to all the roles in that functional area. What I mean by that is there might be an inventory clock, okay? And there might be a supply chain manager and there might be a procurement manager. Let all of them have access to all of the information. And a lot of people think, oh, that's gonna create mayhem. No, what it does is that from a business impact perspective, you give more people, particularly lower or junior employees, the understanding of how all the functions interrelate. And that means that they can better service their end customer, whether that's an internal or external customer. It also bodes well for talent retention, you know, and if you've got the mechanism to track who is self-learning, you know, those are the people who have the capabilities that you want to keep within the organization. And then finally going, you know, shifting away from business results and going back to the practical implementation is that, you know, open up as many topics um, that a role may work with. And what I mean by that across the function. So a salesperson, if we take the analogy of salesperson, they uh, will work with marketing, supply chain, and perhaps procurement. So let them have access to the relevant topics. 
that obviously makes sense within that functionality. You know, so salesperson can access the marketing content, access supply chain and procurement, and limited to that. I mean, don't you don't need to ask, don't need the salesperson access IT or business intelligence, etc. But as a starting point, give them access to the different functions that they engage with. Because, like I said, it gives them a better holistic understanding of the business, um, so that they can obviously service their, whoever their end customer is in a more effective manner, and you retain the right people. Supporting learning in the flow of work is, is a massive passion of mine and something we've got quite an uh, extensive experience in within our organization. Don't have a lot of time to go into today, but we can always chat about it some other time. But my personal belief is you've got to understand three elements to make sure that this is a success in your organization. And what I mean by that is bringing learning to your employees is that I believe it needs to be mobile orientated first. So if you look at the triad of ineffective uh, learning in the flow of work that we've seen is the challenges of data, device, and systems are not addressed efficiently. So you might have a great system, but learners are meant to access you know, the learning at work on a Wi-Fi that's overburdened, or they're not allowed to access the Wi-Fi um, for whatever reason, et cetera. And then importantly, the content is not focused on them accessing it through a mobile device, as an example. So you really got to make sure that you tick those three boxes, data, device, and system, and device meaning make sure you orientate it towards mobile environment, data, make sure that the employees aren't paying for it because that creates challenges. And then system refers really to the last two points, which is, you know, when you look at a system and learning in the flow of work, you've really got to think about how people often learn things today. So it's got to have that powerful search capability. You know, if I'm wanting to understand how to do something, and let's say I'm in finance, how do I raise a purchase order? You know, to be able to quickly and rapidly ask a question and learn that is key. And then finally, learning content. You know, create it short, simple, use the tactile methodologies of audio, video, and visual. And visual, I'm talking graphic, um, infographic, whatever the case may be. So I'm very wary of our time. There's obviously two minutes left, not a lot to wrap up. Um, not a lot of time left for Debbie to wrap up, but I'm going to kick it back to you, um, Debbie, um, to sort of bring us home. Thanks, Matt. You did uh, fantastically with uh, pulling that together um, and, and really connecting. For me, the knowledge management, which uh, is, is sitting within an organizational context or sitting within content outside of the organization, connecting that with the learner or with the employee and, and, and making sure that that comes together. One of the things that we're noticing a lot in our organizations that we're working with is one of the critical skills to make this way of building capability work is building learner and leader readiness, almost like a license to learn and a license to lead learners. And if we can build that to enhance everybody's learning agility and a capability of, of accessing that information, even though if we make it available and be hungry and motivated to see the benefits of that learning and how to make that learning happen is critical. The other, the other area that we're finding to, to make this work is a lot of homework and a lot of collecting the data. So if you take supply chain as your example, is actually itemizing all those capabilities, looking at the role of each person and what their sort of role boundaries are and what is their current percentage readiness to deliver against those capabilities now and expected in the future. And that piece of work can take quite a bit of time, but once each individual and manager and HR knows that that's the work and the path, then getting, giving access to that content and assisting people to accelerate their learning journeys starts making a lot of sense. And then you don't have roadblocks and boundaries in the way to let people fly. So, you know, that, that's what we're finding that a lot of the work that we're doing is helping people figure out what those core organizational core capabilities that give them competitive edge and then per function, what is the technical leadership and then the foundational capabilities as well. Um, so while we're busy doing operating models and, and looking at mapping organizations, we're looking for the future capability. So there seem to be two of the biggest areas of work um, that organizations are looking for at the moment. So I think the, the, the knowledge management is absolutely critical to give access and freedom to that and then making sure the organization is structured around those core capabilities to deliver to customers. Great. So I think we've uh, reached the end of the time and I'm not seeing any specific questions coming through at the moment. 
Um, if there is anything, please just, just shout it through. But I hope you have found today uh, meaningful. I hope you've got some different ways sometimes of even looking at information, some different resources. And for everybody who's on the call today, you will be receiving um, the pack with the information and the access to the resources. If you have any um, further questions, uh, all of us, we love to engage. Um, and uh, please give us a contact. All well, our contact details are on here. And um, for those of you that would like to know more, more about some of the critical capabilities that organizations need going forward, there's a book launch happening on Tuesday the 29th. Just send us a mail and we can send you the details for that. Matt um, and Sunal, thanks very much again from Summit at uh, being our collaboration partners. We've been working for years on figuring out how to collaborate um, and do things together that's a win-win and a benefit and takes you know, a nice balance of, of that effort. So thank you once again for, for setting this up. Are there any last words, um, Matt or Kath, or shall we wrap it up and uh, say goodbye? Awesome. I think let's. Uh, I think a lot of was shared, a lot of information to digest. So maybe we can uh, let everyone go and go to their bathroom breaks and, and some more tea and, and continue with the seventy thousand uh, video calls that they will have today. Obviously. <laughs> thanks. Thanks to both you and Kath. And uh, cheers, everybody. See you again. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Should we stay on just for a couple of minutes? Well, I think Matt's gone already though. It's fine, I think everybody's just saying goodbye. Oh. It's seven people left.